Hello, I'm Richard with ev for You Custom Conversions, and welcome to another episode on upgrading the Carmen Ghia. If you remember in the last episode, we discussed how the uh, Evnetics controller had finally given up the ghost, and so we're going to be making some upgrades and um, not just replacing the controller. We're going to uh, replace the motor and controller and the adapter. And so in this episode, let's take a little closer look at what, what exactly went wrong here. What, uh, what do we know about this controller? So stay with us and let's take a closer look. All right. Here's a shot of the part of the dash on the Carmen Ghia. You can see the JLD 404. It's on the amp setting right now. The ignition is off. And the little red light is our error light and also temperature light. Uh, temperature light for the motor, error light for the controller. Now, normally what happens is when you turn on the ignition that light comes on solid for a few seconds and then you'll hear the uh, main contactor uh, click and the light will go out and the vehicle is ready to to drive so let's take a look and see what it's doing or not doing at the present time so first off Let's take a look at our uh, our voltage. Our pack voltage is what it should be, 146, and uh, it was charged recently, so it's uh, you know not showing much uh, in the way of amp hour hours used, just what the DC to DC converters consumed. So this is the red light I'm talking about. So we're going to turn on the key. It flashes, and the flashing indicates an error code. But instead of going off after showing the error code, it stays on, showing that we have a kind of a fatal fault here. And so all you do here are the, uh, the blower, motor blower, and uh, we're just consuming what the DC to DC converter is using to run things. So, we, uh, we know we have an error. We know that uh, it's not going anywhere. The main contactor's not kicking in. So let's take a look at the controller itself and, and the lights on it. All right, here we are at the back of the vehicle. And the noise that we hear now, we disconnected the uh, uh, motor blower. Those are the radiator fans and the pump you hear now. We can turn those off. So now the only thing that's making a noise are the fans on the uh, Evnetics. And normally they click off but they're still running. Well, let's see if we can get a view of the uh, status lights on the bottom here. Kind of hard to do it and get it to show up on the camera both. Let's see if I can do it. I can do it where I can see it. Let's see where the camera can see it. There we go. So you can see we have the red error light is on and the green status light is doing kind of a occasional flash there. Okay. Now 
let's uh, let's do some further investigation. So now we're connected to the Ethernet uh, port on the Evnetics, and we're going to uh, turn on the ignition, and we'll see what kind of uh, error codes we get. All right, so let's see what it uh, pulls up here. Okay, let's see if we can get a shot of the screen. Just a hair. Okay. So, what's it showing? It says pre charge timeout, no voltage. And if you go down, it shows the other inputs that are programmed in. But this is what we're interested in. So here's what we, uh, what we came up with before. When we first brought it into the shop, this is the error messages. Let's see if I can come in a little bit more on that so we're getting a desaturation error ADC out of range and pre-charge timeout so after having reset it now it just shows we're getting a pre-charge timeout no voltage So let's uh, let's clear the errors. And we'll shut it off and and do it again and see what uh, see what happens. Should be the same. Give it a few seconds here. Ignition back on. We're no longer getting the flashing red light. We're just getting the red light that's on all the time. Interesting. We'll take another look at the uh, status lights here. See what they're doing. Okay, we've got the uh, red one solid. And now the green one's flashing at a high rate. The air light in the dash is also solid. It comes on solid and stays on. Okay, we're going to run a couple other quick tests here. One is we're going to check uh, uh, some voltages. So I've got my lead on the ignition input to the uh, controller. Turn on the ignition. Look at the gauge here. Looks like we're uh, we're good. Thirteen point five five volts. That's our uh, ignition. Now let's take a look at the pack voltage. 
prop that up where it shows up. I don't know if it'll show up on camera very well. You'll take my word for it. We're showing 146.8. Seems to me that's about what the JLD 404 was showing. So anyway, we've got the proper voltages. So, what does all this mean? We've got the uh, error list that we took and recorded when the vehicle first came back into the shop after after uh, failure. We uh, reset them and and saw what it ran again here. We've done some other tests, and so. What does that all tell us? Well, first off, the first error code was a desaturation error. And that's usually uh, caused by an IGBT failure. And, uh, and then that would, uh, uh, it prevents the, the pre-charge from uh, completing. And so, the other one, it was a desaturation error, ADC out of range. Well, according to Evnetic's um, manual, the uh, ADC out of range, it says temperature sensor disconnected or other fatal problem. Well, <laughs> don't know exactly what that is without opening it up, but it's not good. And then pre-charge timeout. Well, that's because of the previous fatal errors. And so, um, and that's the, the, what we're getting now. Current controller mode, it says pre-charge timeout, no voltage. So, uh, basically, we know that because we can hear it. We don't hear the main contactor closing. So we know the pre-charge circuit is not uh, running its course and, and allowing then the uh, contactor circuit to close, which then causes us not to have any voltage. So anyway, I believe this is a fixable issue. I don't smell anything burnt or anything at, at this point. Um, but uh, like I said, I think we'll probably open it up, give you a peek inside. But for us, it's over. We're not, uh, we're not gonna repair uh, this controller or even replace it with another one. It's uh, simply a test bed and it has, uh, the, the, the results are in. The uh, DC to DC, I mean, the DC setups have been good to us. We, we did a lot of them. Of course, the last uh, two or three years now, all we do are the AC setups. But uh, we continue to drive the DC. One, it was it's fun. It has a lot of torque. This is a good setup right here for this car. The other is that uh, in the area where we are, um, I don't need the regenerative braking. We don't have a lot of traffic. 90% uh, of the driving that this vehicle did uh, or saw was, was on the interstate in hilly terrain up and down. And so we, we actually got a lot of free miles because you actually get more range by coasting than you do from regenerative braking. And so we were in no hurry to go to the next, uh, next, uh, incarnation here and so um, this then you know kind of uh, is the time frame the car said let's do it now so now we're going to look at um, some options and you know uh, the options are going to be going to an AC setup and at that point low voltage or high voltage well uh, you know, high voltage would be nice. Uh, we could put a nice uh, UQM uh, in here, but
but uh, it starts getting a little spendy uh, from our perspective in that we'd have to change our battery pack. We currently have a good pack, great cells, uh, 44 of the 100 amp hours, uh, it's a 14.6 you know, kilowatt hour pack, which gives us a 60 mile range with this vehicle. All that's fine and dandy, we're perfectly happy. But to go with a uh, high voltage AC setup, we would have to change out the pack, go to smaller cells, uh, and, uh, and over double the number of cells to get us up in the over 300 volt uh, range. And so that, that's an expense. Whereas if we go with uh, low voltage AC, we can keep our, existed, our existing pack. So that's gonna kind of drive our decision uh, this time around. We're gonna stay with the, uh, with the current traction pack. And so now we're gonna uh, look at uh, uh, low, vo low voltage AC system. All right, so, you know, common one uh, at one time was the AC50, uh, but that's uh, using the uh, 1238 Curtis controller. It's a 130 volt maximum uh, controller. Well, we have a 146 volt pack already. So, you know, things start becoming dictated to you. So, uh, we're gonna use the uh, 1239 uh, Curtis controller, which is good up to 170 volts. So we're comfortably within its range. Um, and then that would say that uh, the, the, the really the two options that we have would be the AC51 or the AC76. Now, kind of, I don't want to say the obvious choice, but uh, by far the more common one for this vehicle would be the AC51. I believe they're around 13 inches long, which is what this uh, net gain uh, Impulse 9 is. And uh, that's why we don't run the Warp 9. The Warp 9s are longer and you have to cut the engine bay to get it to fit. Don't like to do that. But before we make a decision, Let's, uh, let's take a look at the uh, power graphs uh, for the AC51 and the AC76. Uh, you might remember uh, a previous uh, video series we did uh, with the 1991 Volkswagen Transporter. Uh, that one uh, used, uh, we used the uh, Curtis 1238, the lower voltage, 130 volt controller because we were able to fit uh, you know, uh, the number of cells in that vehicle's, uh, what they call the treasure chest, just happened to work out that we could fit 38 cells in there comfortably. And so that's basically 133 volts topped out, you know, right after being charged. And the controller worked fine with that setup and that dictated the AC 75. Well, that was a 4,000 pound vehicle when all said and done. And let me tell you that AC75 and the 1238 uh, was a nice package for that vehicle. Uh, second gear, clutch out, it was uh, breaking loose the tires. Um, and so, you know, it would really make a little 2,200 pound car uh, zip rather nicely. But, Instead of maybe, I think uh, the AC51 is about 128 pounds, it's 180 pounds. So it's a much heavier motor. It's gonna affect uh, you know, our, our range and handling somewhat. And so we need to think about those things. Uh, but let's go take a look at, uh, at some power charts and discuss this a little bit more. Stay with me. <clears throat> All right, here's the power charts. Now this is the peak power for the AC51 and the AC76. 
and the air conditioning is giving me a little bit of fits right now. Anyway, we can see that the peak horsepower on the AC51, this is 144 volts, both using the same controller, the 1239, that at about 4700 RPMs, we hit 88 horsepower. And our peak torque is 108 foot-pounds out to about the same, uh, 4,500 RPMs, uh, 100 foot-pounds of torque. Now, the um, AC76 has got almost identical horsepower, almost a, an extra horsepower, but only out to about 3,250 but it has a lot more torque. Okay, so it's got 168 foot-pounds of torque. And again, it doesn't go out as far. We're only going out about 3,000 RPMs. So these were perfect uh, motors for uh, our, our buses and small pickups and so forth. It was, it was a good good choice. So let's uh, let's let's get a little more information on the two of these and kind of look at them side by side All right. so let's put a few of the specs down for the two uh, setups now they have one thing in common they're both using the Curtis 1239 controller that's a 500 amp controller and uh, 144 volts that's what the tests were done at like I said, we've got uh, 88 horsepower for the uh, AC51, 89 horsepower for the AC76. We have 108 foot-pounds of torque on the AC75. And 168 on the AC76. So definitely uh, wins on those two cases. Uh, not so much on the horsepower, but definitely on the torque. Now this is about an eight and a half inch diameter. And the, uh, this one's a nine and a half. The length is about 13.8 inches length versus 16 and a quarter. So this one fits our, uh, our engine bay better with no, no cutting involved. Uh, and that's the same diameter as the uh, uh, warp nine impulse nine. They're nine and a quarter inch, so very, very close there. Here's where a big difference comes in. This one's 115 pounds. And my handwriting's not very good here. This is 115 pounds. And this is 180 pounds. Winner there. I mean, that's, uh, that's quite a difference. And that makes an effect on our performance, handling, you know, braking, acceleration and our range. And then there's the price. This is $45.88 approximately, depending on who you get them from, you know. But this is a retail price. And so we have another winner there. So Here's the big 
big one that uh, can get people excited right there. But this is important. This is a little bit important too. Um, but here's, uh, here's another issue. Right now, High Performance Electric Vehicle Systems isn't offering the AC76. I'm sure there might be some out there on a shelf somewhere and we could source one. But currently they are not offering it as far as a um, uh, dealer goes. So, looks like we're probably going to go with the AC51 setup. Now, unfortunately, I can't compare the AC51 and the Impulse 9. Uh, and the reason that is, is that uh, NetGain doesn't publish any figures uh, on the uh, output of their motor except for 72 volts, which is half of what the figures are we've got here for high performance electric vehicle systems. So, so but we have calculated it over the years, and if my memory serves me correct, the uh, Impulse 9 at the setup we're running is about 76 horsepower. And I want to say it was about 150 foot-pounds of torque, 9 and a quarter inch diameter. It's about 13 and a half inches. And I think it's a hundred and uh, I want to say it's 128 pounds. This is all by memory here. So I think the uh, warp nine is 143. I think the impulse was at 128. And uh, and of course the price here uh, is with the with the controller. So if you want the Soliton Junior and that, it's about $4,000. So it was, was less money. Um, but again, uh, we can still get the net gain motor. It's getting a good controller. Uh, you can pick up uh, the uh, Zilla controller, 1,000 amp controller. They're about $2,000, just a little bit under. Um, but I've never been a big fan of them. They're, they're great for the racing community. Um, there's just a lot of wiring that goes to them. They're not very aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> and as you've, if you've seen any of our videos and stuff, any, or any of our uh, projects, we try to, to mix form and function. And so that was nice about the Evnetics. It was a, a good looking package. It had a lot of uh, features and, uh, and worked well under most circumstances. But we have kind of a very harsh environment that we're running these in, high temperatures, high demand. And so we've seen what this setup did. Motor performed fine. It's always been the controller controllers. And so we're going to now uh, move forward and see how the uh, AC setup does. See how this Curtis 1239 does. Um, going to use the same uh, cooling system. Uh, we use a different uh, chill plate uh, on the AC1s than we do on the, you know, the Fnetics was internal, built in. And so I'm not sure 
you know, how robust that was. Uh, obviously not enough for our use. But uh, we've never had a problem with the uh, AC ones heating up, uh, either the motor or the controller, in any of the conversions we've done. And we've done quite a few. So, uh, I have high hopes in going this direction. But the only way to really know for sure is, uh, is to do it and put it in play. It will be driven and, and everything just like it has been in the past. Um, and so it's basically a, a, an apples and apples comparison as far as what, uh, what kind of longevity and, and durability this will have. Um, you know, the, the performance is where I'm going to suffer a little bit. Uh, I've driven plenty of these. And, uh, you know, that Impulse 9 with the Evnetics, uh, just, that was a fun, fun one to drive. Uh, not as much fun as this. But this, you have to be careful. You have to do some modifications to make sure you don't damage your transaxle and everything. You gotta secure it in place a little bit more. And you have to modify your, your engine bay. But we're not gonna worry about that. We're moving on from this. This is what we're going for. And so uh, in addition to this price right here, we're gonna have uh, the additional cost of an adapter Coupler, and that's going to be, you know, in the nine hundred dollar range to make a new one of those. So we'll uh, we'll let you follow along. That's about it for this episode. In the next episode, what we're going to do is we're going to start pulling out the parts. Uh, on the Carmen Ghia. We'll remove the motor and the controller and uh, inspect things as we go. And hope you stay with us. And we'll see you next time.